All right, guys, welcome back to View Nutrition Radio. This is your host, Andres Ayes, a registered dietitian. We're super excited because as you probably listened in the, in, in the very first uh, part of this podcast, we uh, have the pleasure to have Mike Matthews, uh, Muscle for Life, and also owner and founder of Legion Athletics. Um, I'm a big fan of this guy, and I just told him <laughs> that. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time here today. Welcome to the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So I guess like I always, this podcast, I always like to learn more about people's journeys and kind of what sparked their interest in the, you know, the fitness world and nutrition and stuff like that. So where does that go for you? Like, where does it go back to? And, and how did this, like, you know, your whole story with like, you know, fitness and nutrition started? Yeah, absolutely. Let me, one second, let me make sure I just have, I sound good, right? You can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. I just want, I want to make sure that it's picking up from this mic and not my webcam. Oh yeah, that's, no, no. It's perfect. Sound very good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to your question, so I grew up uh, playing sports. I played a bit of baseball when I was younger. Then I got into hockey and played a lot of hockey, uh, mostly ice hockey, did some roller hockey as well, but liked, liked ice hockey more. And that lasted until I was maybe 16 or so. And uh, then I was like, okay, what am I going to do? I want to continue doing something with my body. And I mean, I was 16 turning 17, somewhere around that, that period. And I liked girls and I was like, eh, girls like muscles. I'll just, I'll just start lifting weights. That's why I got into weightlifting. <laughs> right. And so I got like some bodybuilding magazines and just went and gathered a couple friends and started, uh, putzing around in the gym and newbie gains being what they are. It's, it's, it's fun in the beginning, particularly, right? Because even if, I mean, you can do just about anything and make progress in the beginning. And what I was doing now that I look back on it, it certainly wasn't optimal, but it was, it was good enough to gain some muscle, gain some strength. And then I also found that I liked, I liked working out uh, in and of itself, regardless of, of my original motivation to, to, to get into it, right? And it, it was different than sports. It wasn't, I mean, I, I still, I look back on, my time playing hockey, like to me, sports are more fun uh, for sure than, than yeah. lifting weights, but I still enjoy working out, particularly now uh, in and of itself. And I particularly joy, enjoy all the benefits that come from it, right? So uh, yeah, all of us, we're, gonna, we're not going to enjoy every workout, but we're always going to enjoy having worked out. That's something we can always count on is that yeah. after a workout, we always feel a little bit better than before the workout, regardless of how much we maybe had to drag our asses through the workout, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so, yeah, so I got into it uh, early on, didn't really know what I was doing, but at least knew that I didn't really know what I was doing, right? Um, I, I hadn't really tried to educate myself. I just had read some magazine stuff, and uh, I, I guess you could say I was, I was coming at it more as like a dilettante. Um, yeah. it was, it was, it was kind of a, a little hobby and I, and it's not something I took seriously enough to want to really dedicate my time to improving. Even I just got consistent with it and liked it and, uh, knew that I didn't really know what I was doing beyond getting there, lift some weights, do some cardio, eat well. And, and as far as being healthy goes, um, I mean that, that there's that, that, that is pretty much it. Right. I mean, you, yeah, crazy. again, you, yeah, it's it's maybe it's not training, per, right? It's maybe exercise, and the difference being there, training, having a clear goal, having a clear system, having clear feedback. Whereas exercise is kind of just getting in the gym and doing things, moving your body, burning calories. And exercise is perfectly healthy. Training is more fun because it's more of a game, right? Yeah. Uh, exercise feels a bit more random, but some people are totally fine with exercise. Some people. Um, you know, over the years now, I've worked with so many people. For example, uh, there are a lot of people out there who like to do exercise classes. That, that's fun to them, right? And yeah, there's not much of, a, of an organized system that you're following if you're just going to exercise classes, but it's perfectly healthy. You burn calories, you have fun, whereas other people are more, um, I guess, maybe goal-oriented and like that's the kind of person I am. So it, it, it's less fun for me to just go and do random things. I like yeah. to know what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And so as time went on, um, that, that being kind of my personality, I figured I was like, all right, well, I'm putting a lot of time into this as it is, right? I'm in the gym at that time. I was probably working out upward of like two hours a day, five days a week, sometimes even six days a week. 
And I was, uh, I didn't know, I didn't know at the time about energy, energy balance and macronutrient balance, but I was just eating well. I was eating more protein than I needed to be eating, but you know, I was eating some vegetables and some whole grains and some fruit, a, a pretty, a pretty healthy, nutritious diet. I just didn't understand like the real fundamentals of dieting. And so along the way, I was like, all right, well, if I'm going to put in the time, I might as well take a little bit of extra time, educate myself, put together a better system, make this a bit more fun and see also what, what, what can I do with my body, right? After seven and a half years or so of, of kind of dirtling uh, around, even being, being, I guess, a consistent dirtler in the gym, but um, not, not being very systematic about it. I had gained, it's hard to say exactly, but looking at my numbers before and after, maybe 30 pounds of muscle in seven and a half years, that's, that's, that's not very good. Um, a guy, your average guy starting out, maybe not average, maybe slightly above average, let's say genetics could gain 30 pounds of muscle in probably his first two years. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so by, by year seven, if you know what you're doing, you're, you're done as far as gaining muscle and strength goes. You're going to get as big and strong as you're ever going to be really probably within your first five or six years. Right. And so at that point, um, I changed, I, I started to educate myself on the training side of things. Uh, my first introduction to proper training was starting strength. Like many people, uh, proper training, meaning heavy compound training, really focusing on getting strong on the squat, on the bench, on the deadlift, on the overhead press, and then, and then tacking on some bodybuilding stuff to add volume to the smaller muscle groups that, uh, will lag behind if you're following just a strength training program on the dietary side of things. Um, and from starting strength there term tr book wise, it's still there. There's not, there aren't that many great books out there. In my opinion, there are some older books, uh, harder to find, but if you're just cruising around on Amazon, there are a, a handful of books. I think that are, that are worth reading that are in the top probably 50. And most of them are, are really not. Most of them yeah. are just derivatives of like a few at this point. Um, and, but uh, I, I came across Lyle McDonald's work early yeah. on and, and learned a lot from him. And I came across Martin Burkhan's work er, uh, early on, learned a lot from him. Alan Aragon learned a lot from him. Also then on the dietary side of things, fortunately, the, the scientific literature is, it, it has, it's a lot more robust on the dietary side of things and easy to understand at this point because of really good research reviews, really, that you can just yeah. read. Like now at this point, there are probably like two or three reviews you could just read. And because they're reviews, they're written pretty conversationally. They're, yeah. they're, they're easy for a layman to go through as long as you jump to the dictionary every here and there, and, but you can understand what mm -hmm. is being explained and and that's really it right like you've just learned the 80 percent or the 20 percent yeah. that gives you the 80 percent training is is getting there but it was definitely not there uh i mean this was how many years ago was this shit this was probably like 10 years ago now mm -hmm. it was definitely not there right and and even now it, it's getting there but uh it's it's much harder as a layman to jump into the exercise the training literature and come out the other end with like a clear understanding of how you should be programming your training, what exercises you should be doing, your volume, your frequency, your intensity, your deloading. That hasn't been tied together, at least that I, well, I would have seen it. So yeah, as of right now, it hasn't been tied together in, uh, oh, okay, here are the three reviews that you can read on uh, resistance training. training. Yeah. yeah, that just kind of lays it all out for you. And I guess it wouldn't just be resistance training, it would also be cardio, right? But even so, so that took a bit more work um, to to get to an understanding where I where I could really really make practical changes to what I was doing and see results. But um, I did get there, and and from that point of of having gained about thirty pounds of muscle in in seven and a half years over the course of the next several years. I, it's hard to, again, hard to say exactly, you know, but I would, I would say that I would estimate that I gained about 10 more pounds of muscle and got, got strong for the first time, nothing super impressive, but reached more or less the upper limits of natural strength for most people, which is three, four, five, right? Three plates on bench. And I'm talking yeah. about one rep maxes here, three, three plates on bench, four plates on squat, five plates on deadlift. 
uh, got close to those to those benchmarks. And those are those are that is a a good target for any anyone who unless you're the type of person who's always just been big and strong, you're probably that that probably is going to be about the ceiling, right? And as far as muscle gain goes, the average guy can gain about forty or forty five pounds of muscle. That's it. Period. From where he starts to forty to forty five pounds of muscle. It's just not going to, no matter what he does, no matter how long he trains, how hard he trains, right? And so um, normally, normally also it's worth mentioning that years eight, nine, and 10, if you do things right, you're not going to gain anything to speak of. So the fact that I was still able to gain 10 pounds of muscle and a bunch of strength just shows that there, you, you can be stuck in a rut for a long time like I was and still... Uh, break through and and make progress if you know what you're doing so that's that's my long answer to how did i get no, into but, this but what that's was my interesting because there's so many like there's like a few different areas in which like, i want to stop by and kind of like you know pick your brain on this the first thing that you mentioned is exercise versus training it's it's a big difference because there's a lot of exercisers but there's not a lot of people that are training you know smartly and especially now that there's a million different exercise classes there's crossfit there's like weightlifting there's all kinds of different things like that so so for people listening in you know what is like like the main differentiation between the two because it sounds like from what you're saying exercise is more from movement calorie burning like you know getting healthy and get building a good immune system all different things like that but training is when you're kind of like targeting a specific target a something like building muscle like losing x mm -hmm. amount of body fat so how did you kind of create that differentiation and where do you usually for somebody that say like comes to you, I know you have like a coaching program. And so, you know, where do you kind of like point people or where do you direct people to like, Hey, listen, you know what? You never exercised in your life. You never moved. So maybe this is where you need to start. And when do you transition them into, okay, you know what? Let's make this a little bit smart. It's like, let's just kind of do more like smart moves in here. So let's just yeah. go into like more like a training program. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I mean, it's also it's also timely that question because I'm working on a book for the forty plus crowd right now specifically, and I'm going to be I'm doing that book with Simon and Schuster. We're going to publish that next summer, so nice. that's like my that'll be my first uh, traditionally published book. I've self published everything up until now, and yeah. and this book one of the one of the things I, I I'm excited about is. The, the training programs are going to be are going to range from beginner to inter, to intermediate then to advanced right because if I have a 60 year old guy who has never lifted weights maybe never even trained his muscles at all maybe he did a little bit of running when he was younger hasn't done that in a long time is overweight um, and maybe even has some health complications I can't really tell him to just go in the gym and start doing, you know, barbell squats, deadlifts and bench presses with like 85% of his one rep max. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be just, like, it, what language are you speaking? Yeah. Not, well, not only that, but then even if I explain to him, okay, this is what that means. It's not smart programming because yeah. the, 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 the chances of him getting hurt are going to be higher than they need to be and they should be. And even there's the intimidation factor. Uh, again, if, if somebody is, is, is older and very out of shape and you tell them to go get, go get under some heavy weight and squat, uh, that this doesn't really make sense, right? Yeah. With that person, if I, were, if I were working with him personally, I would want to see him start with, it might be body weight squats to begin with, but maybe it's goblet squats, for example. We're going to goblet squat instead of, instead of barbell squat. And we're going to do some kettlebell swings instead of deadlifts just to get that hip hinge kind of motion, build some strength through that movement. Um, and instead of a bench press, depending on where he's at, we might even just start with body weight stuff. Or maybe it's going to be uh, floor presses with dumbbells instead of like a barbell bench press, right? Yeah. And, and so uh, that, although for... That, that, that would not make sense for somebody who is, let's say it's a 40-year-old guy who's in pretty good shape, actually. He works out right now. Maybe what he's doing doesn't quite make sense. Um, and that guy, you may be like, oh, you're already squatting. You're already deadlifting and bench pressing. Let's change this up, though. Let's program this better. And so my point with saying that is the, even somebody who's brand new to all of this stuff, they can still train. They don't have to 
approach it with this with, with as 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 mere exercise which i mean you summarize that's really the difference the training is you are you have a specific goal whether it's to increase strength or increase muscle mass and you have a system you have uh, and, and a system means that there are rules to this system. There are steps that you follow. There is feedback. There's stuff you pay attention to to see how it's going, and you make adjustments as needed. And so it's an organized approach to improving something, whether it's body composition or performance or both in the case of, of weightlifting, right? Whereas exercise, it doesn't have that whole system. It doesn't have feedback. You just are there, and you're moving your body. For example, a lot of people who exercise don't track their workouts, right? Um, so they have no feedback. They don't know if they're getting stronger, if they're improving in any way. And that's okay uh, to take myself, for example, in, with my weightlifting, it's training. But my cardio, I, address, I, I treat it as exercise, right? So I, I, I hop on an upright bike for an hour, hour and a half a week. And I'm doing it because I like it, burn some extra calories, get some extra cardiovascular benefits. There's, 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 I think, some good reasons to do cardio in addition to weightlifting. Some research suggests that it may also help that you recover faster in between your weightlifting mm -hmm. sets. It may help in the end, uh, over the long term, you gain muscle and strength a little bit faster. But I'm not tracking my output on the bike. I'm not tracking my wattage or something and trying to improve that because I don't really care. If I did care, yeah. uh, then I would, I would approach it more as training, right? So that's exercise. But in the gym, I, I do care. I'm paying attention to my one rep maxes. I'm tracking all of my workouts. I'm following uh, a very carefully designed workout routine. So that's training. And so people who are new, I, I don't, they, they could start with exercise. It could just be, okay, let's start with essentially moving the body with doing some some resistance training of some kind doesn't have to be weightlifting but i would argue that and let's not track workouts let's just get you going and that's okay but i i would with my just speaking from from having worked with many many people over the years i don't think there's any downside to approaching it a bit more systematically even if the the the, the level of difficulty is is going to be low we can still approach it uh, with a training mentality yeah. though. And, and there, there's definitely, there are benefits to that, especially with weightlifting because, or any sort of resistance training, because it, it makes it more fun. It makes it more yeah. fun. I feel like you to, can, you can paint sort of a roadmap for people and like tell them exactly this is point A and this is yeah. how we can get you to point B. And these are the steps that we need to take to it for, for that to happen. So yeah. And you can watch things get better too. You can be like, Hey, check it out. Last month, you were only moving, let's say, um, you're only doing, you're using 20 pound dumbbells on your floor presses. Now you're using 40 pound dumbbells. That's motivating. And, and if, if you though were to approach it more like just exercise, you, you might not progress much. You might progress less because you're not following a system. You might not progress at all. I mean, a lot of people, they do that. Their, their workouts are not just the same exercises, uh, week after week, which is not necessarily bad in month after month. There are, I think there are core exercises that are worth doing week after week, month after month. But so like nothing changes in what, in terms of what they're doing at all. They're, do they show up every day and they do the same exercises as they did? Let's say it, they go three days a week and they do like some upper body stuff and lower body stuff and upper body stuff. And yeah. they kind of just do the same things, but literally the same things, like grab the same weights and do the same amount of reps. So it just uh, becomes exercise. Exactly. And, and again, it's better than nothing. And some people, yeah. you know, that's enough. But uh, in my experience, even most of those people, if they start training, they actually enjoy it more. It's more fun. And so then they feel more motivated yeah. to do it. And so, um, yeah, I'd say that's the, that's the distinction. And I yeah. would recommend on the resistance training side of things to approach it with a training mentality. And some people also like to do the same thing with cardio, though. Some people, it's cardio, they, ha they have a hard time sticking to it if they're not tracking something, if they can't see some sort of improvement. And yeah. in that case, I would say, great, then we should also approach the, the cardio with a bit of a training mentality. I myself don't really care. I, yeah. I know I'm just, I'm just doing it to burn calories and get the health benefits. Yeah, and I think that's that's huge. And then with that, with the part of like the training, <clears throat> one of the things that you also mentioned is it took you seven and a half years to put on 30 pounds of muscle, which in your opinion, as you mentioned, is, you know, there could have been a lot more if you would have done some things a little bit differently. 
So what is realistic for, for, for men and for women? So maybe this could be a two part question because yeah. I've had clients that come to me and they say, for example, right now I'm working with a girl in Miami and she's being phenomenal, but we have increased her calories like crazy. She's obviously super happy and she's training super hard. So obviously she's been putting um, a good amount of lean muscle mass. But what is like, what's realistic for somebody to, to think, I guess like it depends on many factors like age and stuff like that. But, you know, obviously putting like, you know, nutrition and everything aside, what is the realistic expectation for somebody as far as like muscle gains in months, years, like weeks, because I feel like a lot of people are like completely lost in, in this area. And then they just have complete, very false, realistic expectations of really what it takes. Totally. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. And there's a, a fair amount of research on this, uh, both in the literature and also a lot of anecdotal evidence as well that's been collected over the decades from, from the bodybuilding world. So at this point, I'd say we have a pretty good handle on how quickly men and women can gain muscle. And it, it's pretty simple. So the average guy, he starts weightlifting, he can expect to gain, let's say, 15 to 20 pounds of muscle in his first year if he does the most important things mostly right most of the time. And I say that, I like to say that because that, that's the mentality that everybody should have regarding all of this as well. You don't have to be perfect. It's impossible to be perfect. So don't psych yourself out uh, because you made some mistakes and, and now you think, uh, you know, whatever, it's fucked now. Right. So you don't have to be perfect. You just have to, there's just certain things that you have to get mostly right most of the time. Right. And so, uh, average guy is 15 to 20 pounds of muscle in their first year. A guy with outstanding genetics maybe could, could gain as much as 25 pounds of muscle. Now keep in mind that's pounds of muscle, not pounds of body weight. So, uh, there, there is a distinction there yeah. and, and your average woman about half that. So your average woman is looking at, uh, let's say seven, eight to maybe 10 pounds of muscle in her first year of training year two, you cut those numbers in half. So the average guy now is going to probably be around 10 pounds of muscle gain in his second year. And he's going to have to work harder than he did in that first year for half of the results. <laughs> and, and for a woman, it's about five pounds or so of muscle gain. Third year, you cut that in half again. So now you're looking at the average guy is five pounds or so of a muscle. And let's say a low responder, it can be anywhere from three or four, maybe up to like seven ish or eight, if you have a very high responder and, and for women, again, it's about half. So you're looking at just a couple pounds of muscle gain in year three, year four, it now is down to really a couple pounds for, for, for guys, two or three pounds, maybe a pound or two for women. And from there on out, it just continues to shrink until it's so vanishingly small, you're not progressing at all anymore. And when you run those numbers out, what, what that's, you can, you, can, you can back into that all-in number that I shared earlier, which is the average guy can gain 40, maybe 45 pounds of muscle, period. Uh, a high responder could maybe get as high as 50 pounds. And if anybody wondering, is wondering if they are a high responder, you know if you're a high responder. If you're the, again, if you're the per kind of person who's always just been big and strong, yeah, you're going you're, you're gonna to be a high responder, I guarantee you. Um, you know, there, there, there's some, some very interesting research that was done by Casey Butts that showed that one of the primary predictors, one of the best predictors of natural muscle, uh, natural potential for muscularity is just how much bone mass you have. How big are really? your bones? Yep. And, and anybody who wants to learn more about this, head over to legionathletics.com and search for naturally. And you'll find an article that I wrote on how much muscle you can gain naturally. And it's quite long and thorough and cites a lot of research. And you can, you can get all the details behind why I'm saying this. I'm just giving the, the, yeah, yeah. The, I'm going to, I'm going to, here's the long the story short. Right. <laughs> and I also, if uh, you can also link, I have an article on strength too. how much strength can you gain naturally? Because while muscle and strength are closely related, of course, the, the, the most reliable way to get stronger is just to gain more muscle. There are some distinctions. Um, anatomy makes uh, a big difference with strength, for example, a L little bit less so with, with muscle gain. Um, really just like having, you know, shorter legs, for example, means that you're, you're almost certainly going to be a heavy, uh, be a better squatter than somebody who has long femurs. Um, having shorter arms, you're almost certainly going to be a better presser 
than somebody like me who has monkey arms. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's, that's kind of how it plays out uh, in terms of muscle gain potential. Your average woman uh, probably can gain, uh, again, about when it's all said and done, about half of what your average guy can gain, 25-ish pounds of muscle is probably what your average woman can gain. That's the ceiling. And now, if that it sounds disappointing to anyone listening, you have to realize what that means. Let's say a guy, right? 40, 45 pounds of muscle. Think of like a 16-ounce steak, right? That's, that's a pound of muscle put on your body. I think of 40 to 45 of those. That's, that's a <laughs> like, pretty good amount. That's, that's, that's a lot of muscle, right? And um, if anybody wants to see, uh, I mean, my physique is a good example of that. If you go to, I'm on Instagram, Muscle for Life Fitness, and I post random skimpy pictures here and there, I guess, to show <laughs> that I walk the walk, right? And, uh, but I'm a pretty big guy by normal standards, um, by bodybuilding, Instagram, drugged up standards. I'm not, of course. But uh, if you look at my physique, if, if you're a guy and you're like, yeah, that's, uh, I would say that I have the physique that most guys aspire to. If they're natural and they're, they don't live and die by like the, the, how big their biceps are, then you can just know that I've gained somewhere around probably 40-ish, between 40 and 45 pounds of muscle all in since I started lifting weights. And, and this is where it has gotten me. So my yeah. point was saying that is that, if you're like most guys and you're listening to this, you can get the body that you want. It does not require gaining more than 40 or 45 pounds of muscle. Now, if you want to look like uh, a steroid freak, then you're going to have to use steroids because once you get above that 45, especially you get into 50 pounds of muscle gain, you're talking about like huge. <laughs> yeah. And and most guys actually don't even want to look that way. And for women, if if the 20, 25 pounds of muscle gain sounds disappointing, keep in mind that uh after having worked with thousands of women over the years, the the look that most women are after, which is that lean, athletic, um fit but still curvy kind of look, not bulky, not jacked, also not shredded, still looking feminine look requires no more than 20 pounds of muscle gain. I'd say in most cases, it's probably 15 added to the right places. Obviously, women are more, most women are more interested in their lower body development over their upper body. So they, they, it's going to take them longer to get the legs and the butt that they want than it's going to take for them to get the arms that they want. Most yeah. women, again, they, they don't want to have the type of biceps, the look that the average guy would want in his biceps, right? Yeah. So there's a difference in terms of what kind of physique they're going for. But 15 or 20 pounds of muscle to the right places with a body fat percentage around, I'd say, 18 to 20%, that's it. Like that's, That is the look. And, and for I guys, think, it's 10%. I, 10% think, plus the muscle, that's it. That's the look. You're done. And I think that's a pretty good, good point because I feel like so many people focus so much on like a weight goal, but in reality, it's more, it needs to be more like, okay, like muscle goal. And like, yep. this is how much would that would be. And then of course you body you composition, adjust, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and body recomposition. So we talk about a lot about that stuff. So, so, and I think it's really interesting because, you know, it's, it creates a lot of more realistic expectations from what you're saying. And like, and it's like, you're saying, well, people may be disappointed, but at the same time, it's like, and listen, like it, this took this many years, like, because I think like a lot of people, I, I usually say like, you know, building muscle is kind of like, you know, running or, you know, like biking uphill It's a lot harder than for example, fat loss, maybe more like you're yeah. kind of biking on a straight line. It's, is it doesn't require as much resistance since it may be a little bit easier to lose body fat in some people compared to obviously building muscle. Um, and obviously that's why it kind of like requires a little more extra work. Now there's a part of it. And, and I, I want to kind of refer out and I to your books uh, because you wrote a couple of great books. I do have uh, one of them. They want the guy, they want for guys. And you talk about this like laws, like this three big laws. And I don't want to, I don't want to disclose too much from the book because I want to make sure that people get this thing. Um, but there's like, oh, there's so much in it. We can go. Yeah. Through. <laughs> but there's like three laws that really kind of resonated a lot with me when I, when I saw it, uh, you know, on muscle growth and fat loss that you talk about in this book. Can you kind of maybe elaborate a little bit more about what those are? Yeah. Yeah. So let's say on, on, on muscle building, um, I have to remember, man, I've, I've, so I finished, I finished that. That was an updated third edition to that, to that book, probably a year, year and a half ago. And since then I went right into what I've been working on is, uh, an updated second edition of the sequel 
to, to that book, Beyond Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, yeah. which is a full which is a full rewrite, and it looks like it's to be about the same length as Bigger, Leaner, Stronger, plus this forty plus crowd. But um, going going off of memory, so the first the first most important uh, element of of muscle building, the the first I think this is the first law in that chapter. It's certainly one of them is progressive overload. And, and it's achieving progressive overload. That's, that's, and, and really what all that is, is it's producing higher levels of mechanical tension in your muscles over time. Like your, your muscles tense up and it produces a certain level of tension. And if you want to get bigger muscles, you have to be producing more and more tension over time. If you're producing the same level of tension, eventually your body stops responding to it and it's, you won't get any bigger and stronger from that. So then you go, okay, and that's been, that's been, there's, there's, there was a study back in the, in the seventies, it was published in the seventies that proposed this as the primary mechanical driver. And then a lot more research has been done to confirm that. Um, we now know that, that volume, the amount of work that you're doing in the gym also matters a lot, but it's the, it's the progressive overload is really the key. And, um, you go, okay, so how do you do that? What's the most effective way to produce higher levels of tension? And this has been shown in research and there's a lot of anecdotal evidence to support it. Getting stronger. That's, that is the best way to increase progressive overload in your muscles, adding weight to the bar over time. And then you go, okay, so now I know that if I'm lifting weights, my, my primary goal as a natural weightlifter needs to be increasing my whole body strength over time. That's very important. If you're not seeing your estimated one rep, one rep maxes on, let's say, your squat, your deadlift, your bench press, your overhead press, uh, or, or some equivalents going up over time, you are eventually going to stagnate and plateau. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a big that was a big aha moment for me. I remember back when, when, I, when I learned that and started applying it in my training because I had been, like I had mentioned, I had been stuck in a rut for years where I didn't really see any difference in my physique or, or strength in the gym for years. And when I retooled my training to focus on getting stronger, and that meant doing different exercises, that meant working in lower rep ranges, that meant um, resting longer in between sets. There were a lot of changes that I made. I started gaining strength. Uh, again, and I started actually gaining muscle again, especially in muscle groups that were really lagging um, my lower body because I had neglected it. Um, and but also the smaller muscle groups, my shoulders, um, my my yeah. triceps, my lats, right? And and so so that's that's tremendously important. Um, I have to I have to pull up. Well, it's funny like you mentioned the progressive overload because like, I think I learned this like I got my master's in exercise science and I think like one of the classes that they talk about like you know the ancient ancient history of progressing overload overload which was uh, the what's it called Milo of Croton I actually pull it up in here which is the basically like this like in the sixth century there was this wrestler that basically would lift a baby cast since he was a baby, right? Yeah. And did the same thing for like the duration of his life until like the, the calf was actually full grown. And that's when they started looking into how strength is developed and how you start to increase, obviously like, you know, strength gains and stuff like that because you're increasing the amount of weight that you're building. So that was like, you know, when you mentioned that, I was like, okay, this is like the main thing that I remember learning and like, you know, progressing over a little training and stuff like that because it obviously would make sense. If you don't really kind of like, create a stimulus big enough for that, your body's just going to get just adjusted to that. and It's not going to adapt. So that's definitely one of the, yeah, that's a great point. Actually, I'm going to make a note. That's like, that's a good story. I mean, yeah. I've heard that before, but it, when you, when you, when you said it comes it's, back to yeah, my mind, look it up. his name is like Milo of Croton. And yep. I think this is a, the sixth century wrestler. I'm going to send yep. you it. Uh, no, that's great. I'm going to, I'm going to include that in my 40 plus book. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little an article here that you can kind of like look into that, but that's pretty cool. 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 Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's, so that's, so that's one of the big things, right? And then there's, there's uh, muscle damage and cellular fatigue too. Those are other, you could think of them as muscle growth pathways and they do influence muscle building to some degree, but not as much as progressive overload, not even close. And uh, so previously, my, I, I used to do a lot of high rep training and drop sets and supersets and metabolic conditioning, and that's fine. But that type of training emphasizes uh, metabolic or cellular fatigue, really. And, and that is going to produce increases in muscle endurance, and it will, it will produce some muscle gain and some strength gain, but it doesn't work nearly as effectively as using heavier weights 
and doing different exercises, um, focusing on compound exercises, yeah. resting a bit longer in between sets, and, and really programming for strength, like making sure that you are getting stronger over time, as opposed to maybe just judging your progress by like how many reps you're getting per set or by time, right? Oh, do, do this exercise for a minute straight, right? Um, now do it. And then later you're doing it for two minutes straight. Sure. You've, you've progressed, but that, that style of training doesn't produce nearly as much muscle and strength over time as focusing on getting stronger. It's just a different style of training. Okay. So that's kind of like something that you kind of go for more the most, like obviously strength over like the, the high rep type of training that you maybe have just done in the past, but you think like yep. right now it's more, we should predominantly focus on strength gains because yep. that would obviously supersede um, like obviously like muscle gains in this case. Right. And I think, that's yeah, I mean, to, to put a number to it, I'd say um, here's what it, here's what it comes down to working with weights that are at least let's say 65 percent of everyone rep max or so, which is if you put that into a rep range, um, I'd have to put it into a calculator. I would guess it's probably around 15 reps, right? Uh, 15, yep. 16 reps, right? Or he and heavier. So about 60 to 65 percent or and, and up from there. So you, you, you're, you're not doing, you know, sets of 25, 30 with like 50% or 40% of your one rep max. Yeah. That is not, that's not nearly as effective for gaining strength as doing what I'm talking about. So we're talking about lifting heavier weights. It doesn't have to be just power lifting. It doesn't have to be, you know, ones, twos, threes, and constantly loading the bar with 95, 90%, even a hundred, 105%, but heavy, heavy weights, and taking taking most of your sets to actually i'd say all of your sets taking all of your sets close to technical failure which is the point where your form starts to break down you don't have to go to absolute failure that's a mistake i used to make where i'd i would do these really high rep sets to absolute failure right where you can't even get another rep it's just not necessary and with certain exercises it's dangerous actually yeah um like if you're doing that on a deadlift, that's not smart. If you're doing that on a squat, that's not smart. You, you just need to go to one or two reps shy of where your form starts to break down, where, where you are going to get the rep, but it's going to start to look a little bit ugly, right? You have to kind of get up to that point. And I don't even get to that point more than maybe once every several months with how my programming is right now. But um, so you're using heavier weights. You're taking most of your sets or taking all of your sets close to failure, right? So they're hard sets. It's not easy. You, you, you shouldn't be able to like be talking to somebody while you're doing your set of squats or uh, on the phone or doodling yeah, yeah. around on Instagram. You know what I mean? Like you, you're working, right? And, and doing somewhere between, let's say, six and 10 uh, hard sets per major muscle group per session, right? So you're not doing like 20 hard sets for your chest in one session. That's not very effective. You'd be better off splitting those up. And, and doing, if you're new, somewhere around 10 hard sets per major muscle group per week, you don't, maybe 12. You don't need to do more than that. If you're an intermediate or advanced weightlifter, bumping that up to maybe 15 to 16 is probably a sweet spot. Hard sets per major muscle group per week for most intermediate and advanced weightlifters. Yeah. Some people maybe as high as 20 if you can handle it and it's necessary, I guess. Um, and, and focusing most of your efforts on compound exercises, um, exercises that work multiple muscle groups and move multiple joints and resting probably anywhere from two to maybe even upward of five minutes in between each set, if we're, I only rest that long if I, if I'm in like a very heavy part like of my 90, training block. Ninety percent plus, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if I'm doing if I'm doing you know sets of uh, I mean, let's say twos or threes with a lot of weight, I might rest uh, upward of five minutes, but probably not. If I look at it, actually, I have to look at my training logs. It's pretty consistently around three yeah. minutes or so, um, and and that's it. Like that's the magic recipe, right? And yeah. and how you turn that into a program, of course, takes a bit of work, but that's what yeah. I talk about in my books. And, um, you know, as far as back to your original question in terms of the other laws, there's that your muscles also don't grow in the gym. Remember that all we're talking about here is good, but you have to also make sure you're eating enough calories, or let's just say you are, you're controlling your calories according to your goal. 
they're not random, right? So if, if you want to lose weight, you're, you're eating appropriately. If you want to gain muscle and strength or maximize muscle and strength gain, you want to be eating appropriately. Um, and, and sleep is, is vitally important as well, making sure that you're sleeping enough. Of course, all of us have some bad nights of sleep or circumstances force us to get a little bit less sleep than we want. That's okay. But we should be, again, not going for perfectionism here, but ideally we're getting enough sleep most of the time. And that makes a big difference. Now, here's a, here's a very interesting question. I think you wrote an article on this uh, you know, a while back, which is, you know, what is like your answer to people when they come and ask you, like, can I gain muscle mass and lose body fat simultaneously? You know, and, and you have like the, obviously different schools of thought. Like, you know, there's like the school of thought that says like, well, the stimulus in the gym is going to be high enough uh, with maybe like a maintenance calories or so like that. You may be able to do both. Uh, but then there's the other schools of thought where it's like more, you know, like if you're not on a, on a calorie surplus, you will never be able to accomplish that. So what are your thoughts on this? If you're new to resistance training, you certainly can. No question. That's been shown in a number of studies. It's indisputable. Or I guess it would be undisputable, not indisputable, mm -hmm. but it cannot be disputed, right? Um, you are, because your body's so hyper responsive to resistance training in the beginning, you definitely can gain muscle and strength and lose fat at the same time. Once that newbie gains phase is over though, and for most people, it seems to last six months, maybe eight months. Uh, again, a high responder might, might see a, a year even of newbie gains, but I'd say most people probably six or eight months. Things start to slow down. Your body is not as uh, responsive to the stimulus anymore because it's starting to, to get used to it, right? And um, again, as, you, as time goes on, your potential for muscle and strength gain goes down and the amount of work that you have to do to continue gaining in muscle, muscle and strength goes up, right? Um, and so what we find then is in intermediate and advanced weightlifters, and to put a number on that, I would say uh, an intermediate is probably around a year-ish, maybe a, a year and a half of proper weightlifting, you're now gonna be considered an intermediate weightlifter. And that would be evidenced by muscle gain and strength, even by strength standards. You're going to be probably starting to move out of the novice range, at, at least in one or two of your big lifts. Everybody, we all have our strengths and weaknesses um, in, in terms of the big lifts. But once you get into that phase and beyond, it becomes increasingly difficult to gain muscle and, and lose fat at the same time. And the reason why is... Uh, to lose fat, you have to restrict your calories, right? You need a calorie deficit. There's no way around this. There's no hack that allows you to ne negate the laws of uh, energy balance. It just is what it is, right? And what we also know is that a calorie deficit impairs muscle building. We don't need to get into the specifics, but you can just think of it as your body's muscle building machinery does not work as well when energy is restricted. Yep. yep. It's just, it just is what it is, right? And because your body kind of goes into an energy triage mode, you could think about it as where the now it goes, well, shit, or I'm not getting enough food. If this goes on forever, I die. That's, and your body doesn't know, it doesn't know your plan is just to get abs and then start feeding it enough okay. food. All it knows is it's being mildly starved right now. And if it, can't, if it doesn't correct this somehow, you die. That's what happens. You restrict your calories for long enough you die. Eventually you just have a heart attack and you're done. And that's one of the problems with muscle wasting diseases, right? If you lose too much muscle, you die. If you restrict your calories for too long, you lose too much fat and muscle eventually you die. So your body has different um, countermeasures, I guess you could say, to try to to try to, uh, to, to, to get in the way of your plans, right? To try to try to bring down energy okay, expenditure, yeah. try to try to encourage you to eat more, right? And it also it has a bunch of physiological functions that need to continue to stay alive and it starts prioritizing more, some more over others now, especially when energy is, is restricted and muscle building, unfortunately is not very high on the list. And, and so then what, what we see in, in what, the, what, what, how that plays out practically is you're restricting your calories. You're, you're now, your body is not able to build any muscle to speak of regardless of what you're doing in the gym simply because of this impairment that is inherent in calorie restriction that you can't get around i know some people will say like this is a trendy thing that sounds scientific and 
uh, has gained some traction is like, well, if you maintain nitrogen balance, then, then you, you can yeah. re recomp as an intermediate and advanced weightlifter. There's no research that shows that it goes completely against the opinions of the thought leaders in the evidence-based fitness space, people whose work, you know, I look up to, I follow people who have a lot of experience working with a lot of natural bodybuilders, for example, like if this were a thing, it would, we would not be hearing it from like the random dude on Instagram or, yeah. or YouTube. We'd be seeing it in the scientific and, literature. And by, that, and by that, you mean increased protein intake, correct? Like, you know, mm -hmm. maintaining nitrogen balance. And that's, and that's exactly. And that's what it comes down to, right? And so it sounds kind of fancy. And then you're like, oh, so how do you do that? Oh, you just eat more protein. Oh, so you're saying then if, if I get 50% of my calories then every day from protein, that's it. That's the magic bullet. That's, <laughs> that's what everyone's been missing all of these years. Yeah, I don't think so. I, ironically, I think the average protein intake among, well, maybe not bodybuilders, but, but definitely people just in the body composition space has probably gone a little bit down over the years because I remember years ago where I would be reading these magazines and, they, and it would be recommended by these bodybuilders that you eat upward of two grams of protein per pound of body weight per day. And, That's and I wasn't, the, I wasn't the only one who thought that. I mean, I didn't, yeah, no, I, didn't I, know. I, remember. I didn't, I didn't know if that was right or wrong. I was just like, I don't know, whatever. Sure. Why not? I didn't like doing it at all. I was eating like 400 plus grams of protein <laughs> a day. It was, it was actually disgusting. Uh, but, but that was a thing right now that, that, um, the evidence-based fitness, uh, movement, so to speak, has grown and, and gotten enough traction in the mainstream we we know that and a lot of people are eating less protein than that. They're still eating high protein diets, but now I don't see anybody recommending that. I mean, maybe you can find some people out there, but um, that's yeah. not the general. It's, it's, that's yeah, not even the general like meathead recommendation yeah. anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so the the long story short is if you're new or if you're very detrained, let's say that you were once into lifting and and you and you gained a lot of muscle. And then you didn't work out for a long time. You lost a lot of muscle. Now you're going to get back into it. Muscle memory is real. It's a physiological phenomenon that's been well studied, and um, it's been been shown in, in in there are a number of a number of of studies out there that that show that. I would say the results are almost similar to newbie gains. It's like another round of newbie gains if you if you're very detrained, where you are going to gain muscle and strength very quickly back up to where you were. It's not you're not going to go beyond that, you know, at an accelerated rate, but you can get back to where you were a lot faster than it took to get there. So somebody who is detrained and let's say overweight, and they're going to get back into it now, and they start in a calorie deficit, they can expect to gain muscle and strength at the same, or sorry, gain muscle and lose fat at the same time as well. But if it's someone like you or me, we're in our groove, we work out regularly, um, especially if you're lean, wanting to get really lean, nope, just, just, Restrict your calories and know that you're not going to gain any muscle or strength to speak of. And then if you want to, if you want to focus on muscle building and you want to really try to eke out maybe whatever is, whatever's left to you, because if you've been lifting for a while, again, there's not going to be much left, but you want to give it a go, then you just want to maintain a slight, let's say 10% or so calorie surplus and live with the little bit of fat gain that comes with it. Who cares? Diet it away when you're done. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. That's cool, man. Thank you so much for sharing that. So I want to take you to only like the last five minutes because I'll be respectful of your time because uh, we're not going to have too much time to talk about obviously supplements and stuff like that. But then where is like kind of like in your opinion um, as a supplement, I guess, I don't know if you call yourself a supplement formulator, but you do have a supplement company. Uh, but where's like supplements that kind of fall into this entire full equation of muscle gain and, and improving body composition? Yeah. So one, I'll say I'm not, I'm not a formulator. I mean, I understand quite a bit about supplementation, but I have to give all the credit for the uh, formulations. I mean, I, my company is Legion, L-E-G-I-O-N. And, but I give all the credit to Curtis Frank, who is the uh, co-founder and former lead researcher and writer over at examine.com. So if you go read any of the long form, highly technical content on examine.com about any of the supplements, Chances are it was written by Curtis and researched by Curtis. Um, and so and he, he formulates and he formulates stuff for Legion oh, since, since the beginning, since the beginning. Makes, that makes perfect sense. 
And he, not only that, but I have, so he heads up there. I have uh, w- what I call my, my scientific advisory board because that's literally what it is. And, and so he heads it up. He's the lead formulator, but we also have Dr. Spencer Rigolsky. We have Heno Menselman, Heno Menselman's. We have James Krieger, Eric Helms, Brad Dieter, Danny Lennon. So yeah. we ha- and, and, and they're all, all involved in the process. All the star line. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so I take, I take really no credit for the formulations here and there. I've maybe added, uh, something in the way of like shooting some research over to Curtis that he hadn't seen and something that he might consider, but he understands and, and everybody who I just named, they understand this stuff better than I ever will. Um, so I, I was, I would say more just the, uh, facilitator to, to put it all together and, and yeah. kind of, you know, build a business a- around, around their good work on the formulations. Um, but to, to answer your, your other question, supplementation is the least important uh, element of uh, all of the, all of what we've been talking about, right? So diet and exercise are most everything. You don't need supplements to, to, to get the body you want, especially if we're just talking about body composition. That said, if you have the budget and you have the inclination, sup- some supplements can help. So if you want to get bigger and stronger, you might as well take creatine. It's the most researched molecule in all sports nutrition. Um, some people don't respond to it because that's just that's the nature of supplementation, mm-hmm. but most people do. And most people are going to gain muscle and strength faster just taking five grams of creatine monohydrate every day. Easy, simple, right? And so the same thing can be said for uh, a number of other supplements where I think it makes sense, like uh, citrulline malate. If, if you're into working out, I think it makes sense. If you don't mind spending a little bit of money, beta alanine. I know it's not going to, it's not going to, none of these things are going to change the game, but the cumulative effect of, of taking the right supplements, uh, can be significant if you play it out over time, kind of like how compound interest works, right? Yeah. Um, you know, at 7% money doubles every 10 years. And, and you could look at, you could look at what supplements can do in a similar fashion where it's not, there's no overnight, uh, flip a switch type of yeah. effect but you might get to your goals a bit faster. And then uh, where, where I'm more, I'd say, personally interested and excited about supplementation is, is, is on the health side of things. There's actually a lot you can do to improve your health and your vitality. And um, really, you can every, every, every major aspect of your health can be positively impacted by supplementation. Now, it's no replacement for eating well. A lot of people fall into that uh, trap where yeah. they don't eat really any fruit. They don't really eat any vegetables. They don't eat any whole grains or very little whole grains. They just eat a lot of highly processed, refined kind of nutritionally bankrupt foods. Oh, but they take their reds supplement and their greens supplement and their multivitamin figure that they'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, it's better than not maybe taking those supplements. Although most reds and greens are trash and most multivitamins are not very good either, but uh, I guess it's better than 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 just eating like shit and taking nothing. Yeah. Uh, but you it's can't. Yeah. That's not the goal, and that's not that's really not smart. If we're talking about long term health, vitality, longevity, it's much smarter to um, eat well, and there that's the twenty percent that gives you the eighty percent, right? But then you you can get a lot of that additional twenty percent from supplementation, and so in my supplement company, we have the the normal stuff you'd expect related to body composition, excluding some, like we have a pre-workout, it has citrulline, it has beta alanine, it has beta, uh, beta it has alpha GPC, it has good ingredients. Um, we have a post-workout with creatine and a couple other things. We have protein powders. We don't have a BCAA, for example, because they're worthless and it could be easy yes. money. I get, I get I'd asked, to you, hear I, it, man. <laughs> I get asked so many, uh, multiple times a week, I've been asked for, for probably two years, maybe even longer. I'd have to go back. When are you going to come up with the BCAA supplement? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you, right? And so I've even, I've even, I've even replied to people and let them know why I don't because it's worthless. And the only use, the only reason to take BCAAs is to, to, to drink tasty water, which is fine. If that's the reason you're doing it, then that's okay. I understand some of these supplements are delicious. Um, but that's not a very compelling pitch, right? So yeah. if I made my own BCAA product and I'm very, very meticulous with how I promote my products, anybody who goes to my, go to legionathletics.com, click on any product page and you'll see what I mean. Every ingredient is explained. 
Exactly. Um, there's, there's citations for everything. You are not going to find a bunch of hype and buzzwords and over promises. I think it's very, uh, I try to, I try to balance being a salesman because you still have to sell. I mean, yeah, if, of course. Like go, go but read examines something. pages. Yeah. And that's not selling. You know what I mean? But you're selling something that makes sense. And I think when I ran across your, your post pre-workout, for example, like the biggest things, because obviously I, I work with a lot of like, you know, professional athletes and I have in the past. And, and the biggest things that we try to make sure we want to find something in a supplement that is like very well laid out. It's not yeah. hidden. For example, there's no fairy dusting in there as well. And I think the biggest thing that I noticed with polls, for example, which is your pre-workout is like every ingredient, like here's how much we added into it. And I think that is something that not many supplements actually disclose because they're not well regulated. So when you're adding things and you're saying, here's how much we added of this, then, you know, you're not using proprietary blends. You're just like, Hey, listen, this is what we need. And this is a dose that shows in the research that is effective. Yeah. Then exactly. that is like what makes a good supplement. Yeah. Right? That's the backbone of the brand really, as far as the, the, the USP goes on the product side of things, it is that it's every ingredient is backed by high quality peer reviewed published research that we cite. Anyone can go check it out. Uh, and it, even if you can't get access, even if you don't have access to research journals, you can get onto a website like SciHub, for example, and you can get yeah. access to any paper you want. If you want to, to really yeah. look into the details, like, you know, what did this study really show? And, and I have a lot of educated people who follow me who have done that and, and then have it check out. And then, you know, that, that, that is very encouraging to them. They're very happy to see yeah. that these aren't random citations. Like these are, this is real work that went yeah, into it's real science. formulations. Exactly. So, yeah. um, and so, yeah, so we have, we have quite a few health products like fish oil and we have a greens product that I really like because instead of it's most greens are just a collection of, uh, vegetable powders with some random useless stuff like dead probiotics and digestive enzymes that most people don't need. Yeah. And maybe uh, some extra vitamins and minerals that you could just be getting from multivitamin. You know, we went in a different direction with, with our greens. It's only green because it has spirulina. So it has five grams of spirulina in every serving and which is very, which is very green. Um, but, but it also has some adaptogens that has stuff that you don't, you, one, you're not going to get through your diet. Um, no, I don't think anybody listening is going to be eating like reishi mushroom or, or, spir or, <laughs> or spirulina. Or algae, or, or algae <laughs> to get the spirulina in there. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or, or maca, right? I mean, maca yeah. is, does have a bit of a following, but it's still kind of an obscure, obscure supplement. Yeah. Um, and, and so that uh, is a product that I really like. I mean, it, the it, all of my stuff costs me a lot. That was also part of what it was clear to me when I was considering getting into this business is by, by normal business standards, right? You want to have a markup of probably uh, at least five times from your cost, the manufacturer to uh, the, the MSRP should be at least five times. Now that's considered not very good by business standards. That's like, that's like minimum. Yeah. That's, you should think twice about that what you really want is eight times or better. And the reason for that is not just greed. It's that, the way that uh, how a lot of stuff is sold is there are middlemen who want their cuts. There are wholesalers, right? Yeah. So it might go, it might go from the manufacturer to the wholesaler and the wholesaler wants to double that when they give it to the retailer and the retailer wants to double that to, to the consumer. And so when you have manufacturer to wholesaler, double wholesaler to retailer, double retailer to consumer, double, you do the math and you go, Oh, okay. So when, when somebody, so let's say a manufacturer spends five dollars on a pre workout, sells it to the wholesaler for ten. The wholesaler sells it to the retailer 20. for twenty. It's now a forty dollar product, which is an. Ex I mean, that's a, a top end. Let's say pre workout, right? You're you're not going to get people to spend more than forty max fifty dollars on a pre workout. Even fifty is probably you've probably yeah. priced yourself out to moat for most of the market. You, you, you go, oh, okay, so that's, that's considered good margins, not even outstanding, but good. And you go, oh, so what kind of pre-workout can I make for $5? Shit, complete shit. You can't make yeah. a pre-workout worth anything. You, you get a fairy dusted, pixie dusted, proprietary blend bullshit product for, for $5. And the same thing holds for most supplements, multivitamin. You can't make a good multivitamin for 5 or $6. It's going to be 
your bare, bo bare bone blend of vitamins and minerals, and it's going to have some extras that are bullshit, just a proprietary blend of some yeah. things that look nice. You know, this is funny. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an Instagram post about this. I got an email the other week from a manufacturer that uh, they didn't mean to send it to me. They're working with one of my, I mean, not direct competitors, but a big-ish, uh, Legion's probably a bit bigger, but a big-ish competitor, right? And it's, a, it's an email chain of them wanting to create a multivitamin, and it's exactly what I'm talking about. It's from the, from the, from the company, the, the guy, I'm, I'm not going to, I'd have to check with my attorneys if I should actually name the company, no but uh, can, I can talk, I can talk about it without, without the company, right? Um, so straight up, it was just like, okay, here's what we're looking for. A cost of goods are five or $6 bare bones off the shelf. Like literally just talking like this. Like if you have something off the shelf, basically saying, because manufacturers, if you, if you go to a manufacturer and say, Hey, you have a multivitamin for me? They'll go, oh, yeah, here you go. Here's one. And you go, is this any good? Yeah, sure. Whatever, dude. And that, like, that's the level of care that goes into a lot of the yeah. formulation. It's literally don't care. It's all, I'll, all I care about is five to six dollars per bottle, and and even talk about uh, like pixie dusting, proprietary blend of like I, just just some stuff, some stuff that sounds good, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna I'm gonna post screenshots. I'll I'll, I'll block out like so you don't yeah, know which company it is. That's really interesting. But it's, though. that that's exactly what happens with most supplement companies and most products that is there there's a little look behind the curtains of how little these people actually care about what they're producing and so when i went into it i knew okay if i'm gonna make good products i'm gonna have to spend a lot more money on them can i make that work and what that means for example is forget about wholesalers i can't work with a wholesaler there's just there's just not enough margin in it right and uh, it's going to have to be direct to consumer and so that means that if I can make something for 20 and sell it for 40, those finances can work, which is how it would normally work. I bet I'd be yeah. selling it to a wholesaler. But if I can sell it to a customer for 40, then I can run my business profitably. And even and, even have, a, and have a quality product too. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. And even that, I've, 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 I've talked about people about profits. Like Legion's uh, gross profit is in the range of eh, 35, 40%, which is, uh, that's gross profit, not net, right? Which is... That's, that's normal business. That's not a super profitable business. That's not a super unprofitable business. And it's, it's net is cruising around 10%, which again is like a profitable business, but it's not over the top. And yeah. the reason it works though is because it's direct consumer. There are no middlemen. And um, now I could make worse products and have more profits, but I found what I thought was uh, a happy medium where I can create stuff that I can really stand behind and that is clearly better than any, like take any of my formulations, compare them to any of my competitors and mine will win 90% of the time. Yeah. The times when it maybe won't win is now there are some pre-workouts out there that they, they might have a little bit more in the way of actives. Now they often are more expensive though too. So the cost per serving is, is not gonna be that much different. But I don't even necessarily agree with that kitchen sink kind of approach where you're just throwing all kinds of shit in there. And, and you see a lot of that, right? So some people, they, they, I've, they've asked me like, hey, this pre-workout has like two ingredients that you don't have. And, but I don't really see the logic. And I've even spoken to Curtis and other guys. That, you know, there, there's just because an ingredient or ingredients label is very long doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's a good no, product or that yeah. it's better than something that has fewer ingredients. Um, good example of that is products that double, triple, or quadruple up on different adaptogens. There's a point where it doesn't make sense anymore. Like, why are when you look into the research and you go, okay, really, if you're going to include the this one or maybe these two, these other two are complete over. They're you're, they're not even going to have any effect anymore. Uh, and and but it'll look cool on a label. Yeah. So throw throw and all they, four of them in. And they basically thrive on like the ignorance of people. And they just say, for example, like this has more of it. And exactly. more must be more, more must be better, exactly. right? So obviously that's kind of like the, the mentality that people- And sometimes more is better. Like my, my multivitamin, it's called Triumph. It has, uh, I believe it's 22 vitamins and minerals, all the stuff that you would expect, including some vitamins, including some stuff that you don't 
necessarily get from from multivitamins like K1 and K2, particularly K2. Yep. Uh, a lot of multivitamins don't have that. Right? Yeah, especially if you got vitamin D added into that, they kind of. Yep. Of course, there, of course, there's vitamin D as well. We also, in some cases, have used more expensive forms of vitamins and minerals because they're better absorbed by the body, right? So yeah. pay attention to those details. But then there are 14 different additional ingredients on top of that in in dose well, like you know. Triumph is eight pills a day, which some people, it's four in the morning, four at, at, at in the evening. And some people don't like that. And, I, and to that, I say, I mean, you can take less. It's not going to not do anything for you if you take less. Yeah. But um, if you want clinically effective doses of everything, it is, it is four, four. And you get a month's supply in a bottle, so it's not like you have to buy them every two weeks. Um, but I, I just, I don't, the problem is it's a popular product, so enough people are okay with it. I don't want to go down to... Going down to six doesn't feel like much of a difference, right? I mean, if you're taking three, three, come on, take four, four. Yeah. It really starts to be a difference at, at four, right? So then you could just take them all at once or maybe two, two. But I'd have to kind of gut the product to go down to that. So um, some cases more is, is better, but yes. Yeah. In other cases, particularly with pre-workouts, because there's a lot of money in pre-workouts. And, and honestly, the bar has been raised a bit. And I like to think maybe I had a little bit of something to do with that. In terms of what consumers expect in a pre-workout, they now expect to see a good dose of citrulline. They expect to see a good dose of beta alanine. They expect uh, BTE is being used more and more. So supplement companies, which previously were happy to have shittier formulations oh, yeah. and high, higher margins, they've actually been forced to cut into their margins a bit. But as pre-workouts are popular and they're, they're a popular gateway drug, so to speak, into the brand, they're also willing to spend more there. And in some cases, like protein used to be one of the, that was like the key, it still is, but it, it used to be really the key. It was a loss leader for a lot of companies. Like they were losing money on every bottle of protein that, that were, was being sold in, in a GNC because it was so expensive. Um, uh, but, but pre-workout is also kind of, it's getting close to that point where it's popular enough. And if someone likes the pre-workout, there's a good chance they're going to check out what else the, the brand has. So yeah. companies have been willing to spend more, but if you give the wrong formulator, just more, you, you don't necessarily get a better product. You might end up with a kitchen sink product that is, is costing you $20 a bottle to make, but really is no better as far as bottom line results go uh, than something that could cost $15 a bottle. So yeah. that's part of the balancing act of formulation, you know? Yeah, no, that's huge, man. And I think you're totally right. And I, we, we teach our consumers just to make sure that they're obviously choosing things that are research backed. And then at the same time, <clears throat> the second thing to those that it's effective for that. You know, I don't look at a pre workout if it doesn't have at least five grams of L citrulline, citrulline if it's actually looking yep. at that. Like I don't look at a pre workout if it doesn't have at least like two to three grams of beta alanine in one or two doses. Like, you know, those are like the things that a lot of people don't know and they just kinda look at the the name, oh there's got beta alanine. Yeah, it yep. has like freaking like 0.5 grams. Like that, that, that doesn't really kind of do anything for you. So, so, so those totally. are like big things as far as that. So, dude, this is so super helpful. Thank you so much for like sharing a lot of that. And we're kind of like going over time and just being respectful of your time. Oh, that's totally um, but I wanted to ask, well, the last thing would be just more rapid fire questions. I like to kind of finish sure. out the podcast on a lighter note. So I'm going to ask you four simple questions that you just like, you know, going to respond the first thing that, co <coughs> excuse me, that comes to your mind. So, um, yeah. first question is what is your favorite exercise and go, uh, deadlift because it's always been my strongest. So I have very long arms, as I mentioned, I also have long legs. So I'm like six, two and I have long femurs. So squatting has always been a huge pain in the ass. <laughs> Bench pressing has always been a huge pain in the ass yeah, just because, that's, that's you know, my, my sticking, my sticking point, you know how it is like our sticking point is, yeah, it's not that much longer than, than somebody who's shorter, but because of the nature of sticking points, every inch added is, is a fucking mountain you have to move, yeah. you know what I mean? So deadlifting, I've been able to at least like negate the disadvantage of my long legs with the advantage of my long arms. And uh, I've always done well in the deadlift. So. Yeah, yeah, that's that's me too. I'm I don't have long legs, but I do have long arms. So, oh, so it's super so you're weird. good at deadlifting. <laughs> I'm good at deadlifting. I'm just not good at like you know uh, bench pressing. pressing. Yeah, anything like that is terrible. So that's good to yeah. know. Um, second question would be more related to uh, books, and definitely you can plug in yours as well. Uh, what is like one book? And I know you have a book club, which is phenomenal. I love that part of the blog. Um, what is one book that everybody should have on their shelf? Like that you should literally like you would buy like millions of copies off and you would tell them like you need to have this book it's probably a hard question 
Yeah, I know. Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna give a couple. I, it's hard to just give one, yeah, and and absolutely. it's not gonna be. I, I would say I, I'm gonna pick something. I'll pick a couple that I think transcend just training. Something that can can actually help you absolutely. do better in the gym, but just help you do better in life. So, uh, the War of Art by uh, Stephen Pressfield. That would nice. be one, and and the concept of resistance, and again, very applicable to training, but very applicable to life. And it's not just for creatives, for people that see it and think, "Oh, well, I'm not an artist, so that's not for me." It's not just for artists. Uh, I would say the One Thing is another one by Keller and uh, Pap. Pa- nah, I don't remember War Jay, Jay Keller, but yeah, War of Art by by Pressfield. Life. And the one thing by by uh, I believe it's Keller and Papasin, Papasin or something like that, but whatever nice. you'll, you'll find it. Uh, the the one thing. Perfect. And um, I, I know it's kind of trendy right now, but uh, I I do I, I do think it warrants the attention. Uh, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius yep. and some some of the some of the classics of Stoicism. And I don't say that just because I'm trying to jump on the bandwagon and sound cool. Uh, I can say that I I was into it before it got cool. So at least I can say that. Like I, uh, Ryan before, Holiday wasn't be, my introduction to yeah, it, right? Before Ryan um, Holiday and Tim Ferriss kind of got into pictures and made it famous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is great. I think. Yeah, it's no, great. I love I, it. I, yeah. I, I like I like that, that that it's having a comeback because I think that stoicism has a lot to offer. I think it's a very powerful operating system, so to speak, and it's it's uh, it's very different than a lot of what we see right now in our current zeitgeist. It's very anti fragile, is uh, to 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 take Nassim Taleb's term right, and that's very much it has a lot yeah. of that woven into it. It's very anti victim. Um, it's it's very you, you do what it takes to get results and you don't whine and yeah. um, you don't, and you, you control don't what's fingers. in your control. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. so yes, there we go. Those are good ones. Yeah. Right now, especially with this times of like, you know, the COVID-19 like lock up. Uh, Absolutely. It would be a great time to start reading. So great. I mean, I was doing an Instagram live and, and somebody, one of their questions was regarding like, Oh, home workouts. And I just really don't like them. And what should I do? And Read. I was like, man, my, well, and I was like, my honest answer is stop whining. What do you mean you don't like home workouts? You don't like being in your climate controlled, uh, yeah. comfy. Yeah. 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 Living, living room where you can, you know, take the time to just to, to, to do, to do a workout. And yeah. I mean, it, shit, I don't know if you've, put something on the TV if, if you have yeah. to. And then afterward you have like unlimited delicious calories uh, yeah. waiting for you. You know what I mean? There's, there's a point yeah, where I, just do, stop complaining. I told people like, you know, you can choose to be in this kind of situation, this crisis with this like pandemic, there's like two people that you can be like two, one of two choices. You can choose like to be like the victim and like the, like, I hate the world. I'm so bored at home or like now take it as an opportunity to like, Hey, like let's, let's focus on, on the things that you you've always said you don't have time for, or like, Mm. Hey, like look at the things that, you know, you want to like get a new habit, like start reading, start freaking doing meditation, stuff like that, you know? So I think like it just, some people just don't look at it like, or don't reframe it the right way. So that's that's a huge one. Um, Third question would be, what is a podcast that everybody should listen to? um, And especially this times that will be very helpful. It could be training, could be helpful, like lifestyle, anything. And definitely, I know you have a great podcast as well. So you can definitely plug that in as well. Well, (laughs) Muscle for Life uh, with with Mike (laughs) Matthews. That, That would be mine. And I actually don't listen to many podcasts. It's, it's, it's my, when I'm listening to podcasts, it's because I want to learn about something specific and it's going to be like a finite period where I'm going to be listening to a certain amount until I've kind of had my fill and then I'm moving on to something else. So a good example for that is, is, um, Dan Carlin's hardcore history. I'm sure everyone's listened to it, but I've always, I've always been a fan of history. I like to read about history. And so I've, I've listened to, to all of his stuff and really enjoyed it. Um, and, but there are no podcasts that I listen to regularly yeah, I'm the same way. It, and it, it's just a time thing. Like I, I use my, my time well for the most part. Like if I'm driving, for example, I'll listen to, usually it's like an interview or a lecture of some kind, something I want to learn about. But one thing I don't like about a lot of podcasts, and this is just me, how it doesn't fit my life, uh, my schedule and my needs is if it's a very conversational podcast, even something like this, I mean, I try to do my best to, to, to share a lot of good information, 
But I find that a lot of conversations, you can listen to an hour, hour and a half, two hour conversation and have nothing really that you've taken away away from from it or like, what did I really get out of that? Not much. Whereas if you are watching or listening to maybe a 15 or 20 minute TED talk from someone, something that's been refined where they have to make it maximally interesting, maximally impactful, I find that a better use of time. So there are, I'm sure, plenty of podcasts out there. And that's why my podcast is like that. And I mean, it's, it's popular, but maybe it could be more popular if I did do maybe more of a, if I had like a couple other people and we chatted and made jokes and, and I, it would, it'd be more entertaining maybe, but it's not really what I want to do. Yeah, and so I, I really try to focus on delivering maximum value. So even if I do have a long episode, if it's a monologue where I'm talking about something, uh, I'm, I'm trying to make it as as helpful and as as useful as possible. I don't want people to listen to me talking for 40 minutes and be like, yeah, I guess I got maybe like an idea from that, you know? Yeah, that's really, really positive. And I think I agree with you. Say anytime I do monologues, I try to keep it at 20 minutes and straight to the point. That's yeah, yeah. Like yeah talk that's about a good what's important. Um, last question. Too long. <laughs> yeah. Last question. And this is the most fun one. If you were stranded um, in a desert island, let's say this is like the middle of this pandemic and you were to choose one food to risk to live off of the rest of your life, what would that be? Now, do I get, does it, does, is it going to provide all my nutrition oh, that's or do I have to, there's, is, it, there's, is it a fantasy there's, food? Yeah. There's an analytical brain of yours that was going to say, okay, what, <laughs> what is the nutrition? But then there's like the child of yours that is going to be like, okay, like maybe like, it could be either, but it could be a compound food. It could be something. Yeah. 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 The, the, uh, what is Apollonian and, and Dionysian uh, <laughs> sides. Right. Um, so if I have, I mean, if I'm going to have to pick one to survive on, it's got to be the potato, right? I mean, yeah. that's, uh, okay. that's, that's probably the only, I think that's the only food you can, I might be wrong on that, but that's one of the few foods, if not the only food you can survive on. Like thanks to the Irish, you know, where they, they, yeah. they showed us that. Right. Um, and, and if I don't give a shit, if I'm just going to eat delicious food until I die, then Oh, I suppose, I mean, this is like my favorite cheat meal food, right? So I suppose it might be a really good pizza. I like Italian yeah, food. If I'm pizza. just going to eat delicious food, pizza or, or, a, or a delicious pasta and just eat a bunch yeah, of that shit until go. I get fat and die. That's, that's the fun part. <laughs> that's the fun one. That's good. Definitely cannot live off of like, you know, mentally a potato for the rest of my life. <laughs> I, I probably could actually. <laughs> I, I've been eating, I've been eating the same foods every meal every day for, I don't know, probably like uh, two years at this point. I just don't really? care. So you I like just routine. don't care. Yeah. I, I, I really like routine and that they're foods I like. I still enjoy it every day, but I also, there's the psychological component too, though, that I've, um, uh, I've engineered my diet to about as, I'd say as much micromanaging as, as is worth it, where it's not yeah. just like, okay, eating a couple servings of fruits and vegetables, but which fruits and why, which vegetables and why, and what other stuff can I add in like garlic, for example, I have much to my wife's dismay. I have two to three raw, like cloves of raw garlic every day. Really? I refuse to stop even Dude, though- Dude, I need to bring you back into this <laughs> podcast and talk nutrition because I think that'll be a fun conversation. <laughs> <laughs> could be, could be. Um, but anyway, so my point is like, I like that my diet also is, is as good as I know how to make it be in terms of giving my body it, all the nutrients that I possibly can to, to get as much out of my, cause I look at it as more as like, how does my diet serve my health and my vitality and how does that serve my life and my goals? If I ate worse, for example, I would get more hedonistic pleasure out of eating, but I would have less energy. I would treat, I mean, we all would, it, it, it would impact me. I would have maybe more brain fog and that would get in the way of my work and it would get in the way of my workouts and it, it would, uh, it would definitely, it would grate on my nerves. Yeah. I, I would, I would dislike that more than just doing what I do with my nutrition, eating stuff that I do like. And of course you can have variety. I'm just, I don't know, maybe I'm like a, a no, robot. I that's just don't true. No, I like that. <laughs> well, like that, but that's, that's a pretty valid point. It's like obviously eating with purpose and eating with a why I think it's like yep. very important, dude. Yep. It's been awesome to have you on. The last thing is like, how can people find you? How can people, I know there's a million ways, but uh, where are you directing people right now to, uh, to listen more about you? Is there any, I know you got, you're writing a book right now, but what are some of like the ways that people can reach out and, and, and find out more about you? 
Sure. Yeah. So legionathletics.com is probably the, that's the central hub, right? And um, yes, it's my, it's my, it's my supplement company, but it's also where I have, I mean, shit at this point, it's probably a thousand plus long form articles that I've written and over, over the years, um, millions of words at this point. Yeah, it's, on, on it's amazing. Yeah. You need to have anything. That in your- <laughs> you all need to have it on your on your on your bookmarks on your on your browser definitely it's like you know examen.com is one and then definitely legion athletics needs to be another one that needs to be right next to it so definitely really uh, it's it's a plethora of like you know knowledge so it's definitely super helpful we'll definitely thank link you, it up you. on the show notes uh to make sure that i can reach out to you and then of course on instagram they can find you as like, yep, muscle fly fitness and yep. if people can dm me and they will almost certainly get a reply the dms work better sometimes than other times but i do my best to try to stay on top of that. Um, another great way to reach me is email me. That's like Gmail system is always reliable. So you definitely will hear back. You might have to wait, uh, I don't know, seven or 10 days or so, but you will hear back. So um, Mike at muscleforlife.com. And the reason for the different URL is I had a website, Muscle for Life, that I merged into Legion. It was essentially a blog. Muscle for Life had I was all say, these like I, I, cause I, I was like looking for it. And I was like, I couldn't yep. find it. So figured like, yeah, there, like, it, was, it was just a strategic mover. It's like, it's kind of random actually to have these two different properties and have half of these articles live at muscle for life and half of them live yeah. over here at legion Made especially sense. when bus you know so i just combined them um but i that i've had that email address for a long time and, and a lot of people i still communicate with a lot of people it's out there so i'm like eh, i'll just continue using the email i mean i have a, a legion email too but muscle i'll just muscle for life is, is the one that i've been using forever so mike at muscle cool. for life if anybody has any questions they can email me and they will get a response awesome well thank you so much for your time here today dude and uh we'll hopefully we'll bring you back to talk nutrition because i think it'll be a pretty pretty entertaining conversation talking about how you eat garlic every like raw garlic every day <laughs> that's not it too that's, that's so just much. one of my little quirks <laughs> awesome thank you so much and have a good one thanks you too man 